So, as a pastor, I get an amazing opportunities all the time. But I get to talk about scripture with people. Sometimes I bring it up, but oftentimes people will come to me with questions because they want help maybe understanding scripture or better understanding what's happening. To find scripture maybe that will give them comfort or peace or a challenge at that time in their lives. And honestly, sometimes, sometimes some of the best conversations I have with, with you and with other people here through the church and through our ministry is when we get to be puzzled together on why, why that happened in scripture. What was really going on in that time or what Jesus was saying. One of my favorite topics is when someone says, I don't understand, right? Like, why is this so hard? Or, why does Jesus always speak that way? Right? Why does he have to speak in puzzles and riddles and parables? Well, I mean, it's a great question. It's not something we like in our normal lives. I mean, there are times this does come up, right? There was a time just this past week where um, we'd sent the kids up to go get up and ready for bed, right? And getting ready for bed is for my children is probably the same as it is for you, right? Brush your teeth, put on pajamas. There's not that much work getting ready for bed. Well, 15 minutes later, I go up there and my youngest child is sitting on the floor still dressed without brushing his teeth. And I'm like, you've been up here for 15 minutes. How come you're not ready? Well, well, when I came up, Simon was doing this and this. He starts to tell me a story. I mean, this is kind of like Jesus. People come to him and they say, Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And he starts talking about neighbors. Well, wait, 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 who's my neighbor? And Jesus says, well, let me tell you a story. Right, he tells him the story of the Good Samaritan. Eventually you get around to it, but in our everyday life, we, we don't go for this. I don't care why you, what your brother was doing. What I do care about is why you didn't brush your teeth. Why you don't have your pajamas on. Why you've only taken off one sock in 20 minutes of time. <laughs> And how do you have two pairs of clothing on your dresser? You didn't even wear that today. Today we have a great example uh, of Jesus' reply that seems to not be related to what was happening. Our scripture starts out, right, that these people come to meet Jesus. And then it goes on. They say, sir, we want to meet Jesus. And Philip tells Andrew about it. They went together to ask Jesus. Jesus replied, now the time has come for the Son of Man to enter into His glory. I mean, does that answer the question of, you want to talk to these two? Jesus, there's a, there's a roofer at the door, and he says he's seeing hail damage on your roof. He wants to talk to you about it. Well, now's come the time for the Son of Man to be lifted up. It's an interesting response that doesn't seem to connect. It doesn't answer the question. But what he says after this, though, is fascinating. Jesus says, I tell you the truth. Unless a kernel of wheat is planted in the soil and dies, it remains alone. But its death will produce many new kernels, a plentiful harvest of new lives. Those who love their life in this world will lose it. Those who care nothing for their life in this world will keep it for eternity. Anyone who wants to serve me must follow me. Because my servants must be where I am, and the Father will honor anyone who serves me. Well, this whole kernel of wheat is a great analogy for what he's going to do. Right? We know what he's talking about when he says this whole kernel of wheat must be planted in the ground. It must be sealed away in the earth. Because only then will it sprout. And only then will it grow into a harvest of hundreds and thousands and millions of lives that are saved through it. So what are we supposed to do? If the question is, is that a riddle, then what should we really do? Well, we have to do like the disciples. We have to follow along. We have to listen even when we don't understand Try our best to be part of it. I mean, you know what the scripture says, right? We know what this riddle, what this story about the parable or about the wheat and the kernel really means. Sometimes, sometimes when we read Jesus give this weird response, we think it's confusing. 
or we want it to be confusing because we don't like what he's really saying. We don't like what we're hearing. What well, Jesus says, new life only comes through death. It only comes through giving up of everything. That's how you get everything. You got to first give it up. You got to first be willing to die. Well, I don't like that. So maybe this is an analogy about something else. Maybe he's telling me I need to give more. So I'm reminded of um, the, the students down here at the school that I teach. And the middle schoolers, and I've shared some of this with you in the past, or certainly certain people. Um, with, with my middle school classes, I was doing a technology project where they were making slideshow presentations. Right? And I did my best. I wrote like a page of instructions so that it would be super clear. So for the eighth graders, their topic was Washington, D.C., because we're getting ready to go in about a month. So I assigned them all different locations. And I said, you're going to make a slideshow presentation. And it's going to be between six, six. And I do this, right? Because sometimes people can't count, I guess. Six and ten slides. Right, Grace? Did I do this? Yes. Six and ten slides. No less than six. No more than ten. And here's a list of about seven things you're going to tell me about your location, right? What's the history? When was it built? Why is it important to our nation's story? Why is it important for us to visit? That type of stuff, right? Give me a photo, blah, blah, blah. And to make it simpler, part of their grade was I gave them a paper that also asked all these questions. And if you filled out the questions, you got points for the paper, and then you just transfer that into the slideshow. And it's not a surprise, right? I say this to them. If you fill out the paper, you copy and paste that into your slideshow, right? Within minutes, within minutes, I don't know what you want me to do. I don't even understand. <laughs> so am I making a picture for you? I don't know how to make a PowerPoint presentation. I'm like, well, I don't understand. I don't, I don't know how to use PDFs. Nobody's talking about PDFs. <laughs> so it's like, if you don't like what you're hearing, Sometimes in life we confuse it. We think, well, it must be something different because that actually makes sense to me or connects with me or I understand it, but I don't want to do it. <laughs> right? I feel like I'm taking crazy pills someday. <laughs> I think Grace did quite well in her project. So... Grace is the exception, right? Grace is not the, the only exception, but, you know, by and large, people are difficult. It's human nature, though, right? Like, if we don't like what we're being told, we think we're confused by it. We think we don't fully understand. I mean, this happens in life. If you've ever supervised anybody in a job, whether they're an adult or not, if you give them something to do and they don't like it, they are going to be confused and you're going to have to explain it three or four times. Maybe they're obstinate, but also it's just part of our human nature. Jesus, Jesus was fully divine and fully human. And this passage, our whole passage that Bobby read for us today, really gives us both aspects. We see the humanity of Jesus in 27 when it picks up. Now my soul is deeply troubled. Should I pray? Father, save me from this hour. But this is the very reason I came. Father, bring glory to your name. Then a voice from heaven saying, I have already brought glory to my name and I will do so again. Jesus knows where this whole ministry is going. But maybe he's a little confused, and there's another way God's going to do it. So we're just going to throw that out there. On our journey of 40 days during Lent, we're talking and we're thinking a lot about the sacrifice of Jesus. And hopefully, hopefully we're, we're joining in together and try to shed some of what's holding us back, right? Some of the things in life that make us comfortable or make life easy or make life seem simple. So that we can focus more on our relationship with God. So we can find time to be silent enough to hear what God is saying to us. So we can grow closer to Christ. Today, today we have this scripture. 
which points out that following Jesus is going to be hard. I mean, he's super blunt at saying that. It may even call us to die for our faith if we truly trust in him. But through that, through giving up our lives, we're going to find eternity. We're going to find a life that is so much better than the nine to five and looking forward to retirement. So all that is really well and good. And sometimes, sometimes we kind of just dig into that. And we let the sermon end right there with a call. Why aren't you giving up your life for Jesus? Why aren't you trying harder? You just got to give up all that you have. Maybe quit that job, start volunteering more, move overseas, do something that's more meaningful than what you're doing. It's a great scripture to just stop right there and have kind of that, you're all sinners, you better come up to the altar because you're the worst. But I don't want to leave it there. But I don't want to leave it there. I want to look at this scripture a little more. And I want to look at it in the light of the holiday we're actually celebrating today. As my own hand has written, I was born in Britain when Romans reigned over the place. Though the son of a deacon, I shunned the Lord's beacon and never cared much for his grace. Then when I was still childish, the fierce pagan Irish snatched me and stole me away. So with no one to save me from those who'd enslave me, that's when I started to pray. Prayed to the God who had freed me from sin, that he'd free me from slavery's abyss. But while I was awaiting the Lord's liberating, the pagans would taunt me like this. Now, Patrick, come sing of the one who has saved you as you clean our mold ridden socks. Come on now, holy boy, call on God's son as we beat you with sticks and or rocks. Six whole years they enslaved. Guys, seriously, I'm trying to do a song here. Sorry. Six whole years they enslaved me, but he who had saved me, his will would not never be done. So one day while a dream and I heard a voice screaming, a voice that was telling me, Run, Patrick, run, to the coast wide with foam. Run, Patrick, run, God's bringing you home. Was my hope when I spotted a boat and the captain then let me on board. But when he bought his nipple, I I'm didn't... sorry, what? Oh, yeah, uh, for the Irish pagans, a way that you would often pledge loyalty to your male leader was to, uh, nurse from his chest. That's gross, dude. Right, but the reason I brought this up in my confessions was to point out that I didn't do this. And yet, that does not make the image you just put in my head any less terrifying. Can I get back to my song now? Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. You get back to your song, and I'm going to try not to throw up in my own mouth for the next 75 years. All right, where was I? And then brought me home, thank the Lord. Back in the arms of my mother and father, living the life I had missed. But so strangely, while dreaming, new voices were screaming, all of them telling me. Come on now, Patrick, come back to the land of we pagans who gave you your chains and your strife. Give us love and forgiveness. Extend us your hand with the word of the author of life. How can I go back and forgive all those sinners who put me through hell? And yet how could I not? Since the blood that forgave me forgives them as well, know the ones across the at last. No, 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 not John Valjean. I'm St. Patrick, and I'm just trying to finish my song about how the true slaves are the people who enslaved me in Ireland because they don't know Jesus, so that's why I... You must preach them the gospel. Yeah, that. Valjean. Oh my gosh! Last. After this revelation, I sought ordination, then looked at my bishop and clan. Let 
me preach him who saved me to those who enslaved me and this is what my bishop said okay go patrick go to the land you once lay go patrick go preach the savior who bled Hey, look, it's Patrick that we put in chains. What are you doing back? I have come to proclaim that the one who forgave me is right and wrong. So come gather around, let me sing you a song. Reach, Patrick, reach. Save the souls on the high. But don't lose heart, cause it might take a while. All done. What? Yeah, I converted all the people. How'd you do that so far? I just preached him who saved me to those who enslaved me and freed them from death and from sin. And he also told us that if we became Christians, we wouldn't have to do the, uh, you know, nipple thing anymore. Wait, is that why you converted? No, Patrick, don't worry. You had us at the death and resurrection of Jesus. Yeah, Patrick, we're just saying that as far as ancillary benefits of converting to Christianity go, you couldn't ask for a much better one than no longer having to pull men's sweaty chest hairs out of your teeth. <laughs> Okay, Patrick's, we're once again suggesting that you go to the Issues Etc. conference, this one being located in lovely Chicago, Illinois. Come and hear a myriad of wonderful speakers, including Wee Willie Whedon, not Willie Wesley, Hans... Okay, Patrick's, we're once again suggesting that you go to the Issues Etc. conference, right. this one being located in lovely Chicago, Illinois. Classy church video. <laughs> I watched the video yesterday. I was looking at another video to show you, and I found this one yesterday and watched it with the younger two boys. And um, Renee came home, and Corbin said, guess what they used to do in Ireland with people and chest hairs in their mouth? And I was like, wait, 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 wait. That's not exactly what happened, right? Like, like just, just, just wait. And so, but, but all true. All true and so much of St. Patrick that we don't know. I got two other St. Patrick's facts for you. St. Patrick's mission, right, um, to Ireland was around 430 AD to about 460 AD. And it is pretty much the only evangelistic mission, right? Any church mission during the whole fifth century in Europe. At that point, the church had kind of grown to where it was and they were pretty content for the most part. He was revolutionary to once again hear that call that Jesus gave that said, go, go and preach freedom and that they've been saved. Also, Patrick's love for the written words of the Bible, most likely the only book he ever read. It's the only book or writing that he ever quotes in any of his writings we still have. But his love for the Bible and the written word was passed on to the church that would be founded there, the Celtic Church, which became the most learned body of churches in Western Europe during the Middle Ages. Ireland was one of the places where people could read more than any other place in Europe because he passed on this love for, for the Bible, for the Word of God. So St. Patrick, is, as we've heard, um, is this saint because he does this radical thing. He returns to those who had captured him as a slave, as a boy, and taken him. He returns to them to say that they are the ones that are truly enslaved because they don't know the freedom that comes through Jesus Christ. But he's a saint. I mean... This is what saints do. What about normal people, right? What about us here, the rest of us? Well, just a short list of those who were willing to hear this call and do something. The Collins and the Vances, just about a month and a half ago, spent some time in Chicago packing Operation Christmas Child boxes to go overseas to countries where the gospel is not allowed in. Renee's going back to DR Congo this summer. Marianne, Pat, and Beth, I feel like every time I turn around, one or two of them are going to be gone for Emmaus because they're serving and these teams to do amazing things. Ray and Ron, well, I mean, as Ron will tell you, he's always ready to go to prison. 
you know, for the good news. Marilyn, Bill, and James are in the school every week working with kids. And Marilyn's not here, so I can tell you this, but if you've ever asked her, if you haven't, you should ask her about her third grade class that she reads to. It, I don't know if it's the highlight of her week, but she is always so excited to see those kids. And they're excited to see her. And maybe one of the biggest saints we have in our, in our building today, William. <laughs> Just leave it at that, right? <laughs> maybe someday they'll make a song about you, William. Um... Losing our lives to God does not mean we're going to burden ourselves to save the world on our own. It means that we've been given opportunities and gifts and a calling to do what we can to share the good news through word and through deed. I mean, for some people, it does mean we know those, those martyrs. Those Christians who are called into the most challenging situations and they go because they seem to have supernatural faith. And through that, they may lose their, their physical life. But for all of us, when we're called by Jesus, we're going to give up some of the comforts of our lives, some of the easiness, some of the logic of our lives so that we can go and do what Jesus wants. And we've all experienced the times when we've done that. And we have received more of a blessing than we have given. Now, again, it seems like we should be about done with this sermon. This is a great place to stop. But I still have two more points because our scripture was so good this morning. Again, Jesus says, now my soul is deeply troubled. Should I pray, Father, save me from this hour? But this is the very reason I came. Father, bring glory to your name. Then the voice from heaven speaks. And Jesus tells them, the voice, the voice was for your benefit, not for mine. The time for judging this world has come when Satan, the ruler of this world, will cast out. And when I'm lifted up from the earth, I will draw everyone to myself. He said this to indicate how he was going to die. What we do when we read this scripture is we will often overlook how the people of Jesus' day heard it. What they heard happening and what was crazy about it, even when John wrote this scripture and started sending it around to people as these early gospel letters, we miss what they would have found fascinating and focus on something else. Right? We focus on this death part that Jesus talks about, that kernel of wheat that must be sealed into the earth. Because we know what that means. But for them, for them to have this Messiah who had brought someone back from the dead, who had healed and performed miracle after miracle, this would have been the most puzzling thing to think of. Why does he keep talking about death when he is embodying what it is to be alive? For them, for the early readers of this gospel, they would have been caught up in those first three lines. Some Greeks who had come to Jerusalem for the Passover celebration, paid a visit to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee. They said, Sir, we want to meet Jesus. Philip told Andrew about it, and they went together to ask Jesus. It's important. It's important to know that they were Greeks, that they were Gentiles. These were some outsiders who had heard about this person and were coming to experience it. And as they come to experience it, they go, they go to Philip because most likely he would have had some sort of connection. So they come and they say, we would like to meet Jesus. And Philip says, all right, well, why don't you wait here and I'll go see if this is a good time. They would have heard this scripture of these outsiders who had seen something amazing happening, and yet they are only allowed to get so close. This is like the little children that the disciples pushed aside that day. 
They're not quite worthy enough to come in to Jesus' full presence. They've got to stay on that outskirts. This would have been radical. A rabbi that is so popular, so well known, that people outside of the faith know about him? Who's sharing this? And why are they coming? The question we need to think about during this season is, are we gatekeepers? Are we gatekeepers when we're looking forward to our Easter celebration that's coming up? Or are we supposed to be the door holders? Are we going to be those that are going to fling the doors open so that everybody gets a chance to come in? If we're preparing for Easter, if we truly believe that Easter is the time when Christ spills into the world in new and meaningful ways, then are we going to bring people into this? Or are we just going to look forward to what we're going to do? Are we looking forward to the celebrations and the meals and and the clothing that we're going to wear so that we can celebrate? But we're not so concerned about those those on the outside? This is exactly what the Greeks experienced that day, those Gentiles. And it's exactly what we need to see. Jesus says, once I'm planted into that tomb, once I spring from there, it's no longer about who you want in and out. It's who God desires. I am convinced, 100% convinced, that when Christ returns, we don't know what day it's going to be, we don't know what year it's going to be, but I'm convinced it's going to be an Easter morning. As we stand out in the gardens, people go with their church to the cemeteries. Churches fill up on Easter morning and we sing the songs. The morning has broken. It's a new morning because the world is being recreated. This is what we're looking forward to in Easter. Not another yearly celebration. It's not a milestone. It's not a birthday. It's when... The world is made new, just as it was when those women went to the tomb on that Easter morning. This is what we need to do. We need to throw the doors open and invite everyone we know to come in so that they can experience the freedom that St. Patrick was sharing and the freedom that we have come to know and need. Amen. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you give us so much to think about in your words as you challenge us to not, to, to not hold people out, to not look for little and easy ways to, to be closer to you but instead to pour all that we are into being your disciples, into growing your kingdom so that more people, more souls can experience your love and salvation. Lord, we thank you for this reminder once again that you have done everything that we need for our salvation and you ask us to share it with everyone we know. Amen.